Hey, y'all. We're back. Episode four. Well, that looks like eight. Four. (laughs) Four. (laughs) Yay. I'm so glad to see you guys, especially after this awesome week in General Hospital Port Charge land. Shout out to Britt talking about if you miss a day, you miss a lot. (laughs) Yes, so we got a lot it's, to talk about. <laughs> it's definitely been. Before we hop in, how are y'all doing? How are y'all doing this week? I'm doing well. I am um, causing some good trouble, and it's always fun when you do that. Um, but I'm also super excited because there's another Marvel movie out, and I'm going to go and watch it. So happy, happy day for me. I am in a different time zone than y'all. Um, I, my, I went home to Milwaukee. My mom had surgery. She's doing very well. She's out actually running the street right now. She might come in um, while we're recording behind me, which is like always an interesting thing. Um, and it's been interesting because I've been watching TV live, you know, in my life, it's all streaming. So it's like Hulu a little bit later in the day or the next day. Um, and now I'm like watching things live, watching commercials. I'm like, what is this life? I've actually had a chance to like live tweet a GH a little bit from our um, Twitter account, which has been interesting. Um, but for me, all is good. My mom's doing well and um, I've adjusted to the two hours uh, of a time difference and I'm sure I will have a hard time adjusting back. <laughs> Andrew, how are you? Well, you know, in, in my TV world is great. It's a rich, rich world. Uh, I watched Midnight Mass. I mid I binged that at the beginning of the week and it was so great if you can tolerate horror I highly recommend I'm a big fan of Mike Flanagan's um horror shows he also did like House on Haunted Hill um it was it it was beautiful and also uh all of us ex-Catholics I'm sure we're talking about it in therapy um and then of course Grey's and Station 19 started back up again yes I'm still watching Grey's and I'm proud of it um uh, I really don't want to talk about the rest of my week though because it sucked it was stressful and ugh. but TV mm-hmm. great and GH was such an anchor in uh in this in these wild times hey I I'm actually watching- glad that you brought up uh I'm glad you brought up Grey's I didn't have it on our docket but definitely want to talk about her girl, Nancy Lee Gron, and her comments about Ellen Pompeo. We can do that at the end. I didn't see that. Oh, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll catch you up. <laughs> we'll catch you up. I do know that Ellen Pompeo said, admitted that she went off on Denzel. And I know a lot of people are upset about that. But I don't know. I didn't know Nancy Lee Gron had the temerity to make a comment. But let's, yeah. She's not you- upset. <laughs> spoiler alert Nancy is not upset that Ellen did that um but let's hop into it we'll talk about all of that at the end um as our behind the scenes peak um let's get into the recap um I wrote a little one up um so this was like we said a pretty exciting week um I obviously things could have been better but you know um blq and maxi meet up at charlie's where we learn maxi has two plain clothes cops as escorts because peter, peter is still on the loose uh jocelyn sees them and announces that sunny is alive um blq is of course overjoyed and maxi acts not- noticeably strange uh they all depart blq and yuri with a little something for monica can we talk about how cute yuri's crush on monica is um and Josh and Maxi uh, back to the Corinthos compound. Maxi tells Carly and Josh that Nina knew Sunny was in Nixon Falls for months, but stopped short of telling them about Smina, which I learned from Twitter is Sunny, Mike, and Nina. Um, Jason and Sunny talk at the cemetery in front of Sunny's gravestone. They catch up a bit, but it's mostly about whether or not Sunny is on his meds. Uh, Sonny tells Jason that Nina knew he was alive, and Jason clocks that Sonny is not as mad as he should be. Um, at the hospital, Sonny shares some scenes with Epiphany, where he gets caught up on Jibrit, and Britt herself uh, tells Jason, um, I don't give a damn about you, <laughs> when he offers, again, his hope to find Liesl. Uh, meanwhile, Carly heads to the Q Mansion, where she finds Nina with Wiley. 
Uh, we see the women, women go at it. Nina lets it come out that she's still furious about Nell. Carly brings up Sunny's children and what Nina did to them. Um, and after tracking Carly's phone yet again, Jason comes in uh, in time to stop Carly from getting physical with Nina after talking about Morgan. Uh, Carly continues to be on her warpath for Jax. Jax comes in and plays mediator to her parents and also slams Nina to her dad. One day we will talk about how Jax is parenting her parents. Um, we catch up with Valentina and Anna in Greece, finally, um, and they make the most of every second of screen time. Um, they find the real Chloe Jennings at the hospital and spend some time together at the hotel bar. They get drunk and talk about their shortcomings, their relationship, and they make out like teenagers. It is very, very hot. Um, but super spy Anna does not notice that someone knows that they are there and that Valentin is drugged. She assumes he is passed out and drunk and heads back to the hospital. Ava and Nicholas discuss their divorce with Scott. With Liesl missing, we see Scott rooting for their true love, but making sure that they know he is still billing them. <laughs> Scott also runs into Nita and warns, him, warns her that Carly is dangerous. Maxie and Austin have some dinner together and BLQ breaks it up, accusing Austin of using Leo to get to her family. And finally, the stalker storyline blows up. Trina plans to tell Spencer, Trina's plan to tell Spencer that his father is leaving with Ava, leaves Esme to uh, write to Sunny. She tells Sunny that not only are Nava um, leaving, but they are taking Avery. Sonny rolls up to Windermere with his muscle to threaten a very confused Elizabeth, or Elizabeth, whoo, Nicholas. Spencer eventually confesses that he is responsible. And at that, and at that part, um, he does not tell on Esme, which is actually one of Sandra's predictions. So yay for Sandra. Um, he says it's all him. Trina is not buying it. Nick is furious. Sonny is annoyed. Cam is perplexed. <laughs> we see Esme at Spring Ridge to visit Ryan. She runs into Ava, and Ava knows something is up and heads to Windermere. Esme, Esme tells Ryan she's sorry for the delay. We end the week with Carly telling Sonny they need to talk about Nina. What a week. What a week. Tell, it, tell me what you think. What do you think? Um, I think overall this week was, I think the better weeks as far as if you're talking about sweeps or anything, this wasn't a sweeps week, but it should have been a sweeps week because I think it was more exciting and more engaging than whatever was happening on the previous week. Um, and so that was great. There was a lot of great moments. There's a lot of tongue in cheek moments that I loved. Um, and I think as usual, teen scene um, knocks it out of the park. Um, yeah, so overall, I think this week was a fantastic week for viewing and I'm super excited about what's gonna happen next. Yeah, I agree. Um, <laughs> I. I mean, it was all my faves like all week long. So I just felt pretty giddy all week. And of course there are things, and we'll get to this as always <laughs> later on in the podcast that I would shift, but I just like overall feel very like some, some renewed faith um, in the show and um, just appreciated the chaotic energy, especially at the end of the week. It was very chaotic and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll also say the acting was just like top tier. I mean, I'm sure we'll get more into this in some favorite moments, but my God, I mean, I, I text Sandra, I was like, maybe this is my history with fuck boys, but Spencer is forgiven. Like just over, <laughs> I'm done with, it's fine. It's okay. Let me comfort you. It's okay. <laughs> um, I, the acting was just so good. I mean, the teens delivered as normal um, with the drama, with the like heartstrings. I just, I was very pleased with that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I feel like let's, let's get into some favorite moment territory. I am dying to know about your favorite moment, Tanya. It's hard because I have three. <laughs> <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> I 
three favorite moments <laughs> because there was a lot going on this week. That was awesome. And it's hard for me to choose one. I will, how about I will go into something that I, my, I guess my favorite was the scene with Esme and Joss, I think. Um, admittedly, Esme had the best line. It was classic. Mind your business is free. Minding mine will cost you. And I talked about it on Twitter. Minding your business is free is the only thing that I've heard amongst folks. And when I say folks, I mean people of color. And so when she whipped that out, I was like, ah! Esme got some black in her or something like that. I was like, it's amazing. And then someone was like, what? Esme is horrible. But I was like, mm. I have to get a shout out to that line. Um, but I also want to give a shout out to Eden McCoy and just like how Joss and that Joss and Esme dynamic is awesome. Now, a lot of people do not appreciate the, you know, Carly... 100% all the time type thing. And, you know, they're, they'll look at whatever Joss is doing as mini Carly. And so that's something that's bad, but I like it because one, there's continuity, like Joss growing up and being a fixture in the story in the future is great Two, It brings on the drama, no matter what you think about Carly, she brings on the drama steers, you know, stories, and Joss being a little mini me is great, but she's, Joss is different than Carly because Joss will take a step back and she will tell her mama to take a step back and think about what you're doing. But I think Esme draws out in her, the Carly impulse to want to smack a bitch, right? So she, and that is awesome. I love that fieriness. I love that you're crazy and I'm going to call you out and I ain't afraid of you. And the only thing is I was disappointed that she didn't do more with the fact that Esme is actually talking to Sunny, because I think that's a step too far. And I'm hoping in the coming weeks that we'll see more of that. I'm hoping that, you know, in the conversation that undoubtedly Sunny will have with Joss about what happened, that she may get in trouble and that will make her more mad at Esme <laughs> or, you know, kind of use it to be like, don't come from. Yeah, because I think that should have been the response that Jocelyn had to Esme. Like, who are you to come to my family and cause some mess? <laughs> you know, so. So, yeah, that there was a lot going on with that story. It was. It was amazing and I'm looking forward to more to come. So shout out to both actresses. Um, I think you guys are going to make things some make things really interesting over the summer. Mm. <laughs> I do want to say I think that to your point, Tanya, though, it, like Joss to me is like, and I've said this before, is like a mini Carly and Jax. Like it's mm -hmm. like the difference between them is that I think the reason that Joss didn't go off is because she was like, okay, this girl is a mess. And I want to smack this bitch down. But guess what? I also know we have a plan. And so yeah. that's what makes her a little bit different than Carly because she has a pause. And she was mm -hmm. like, you know what? I'm going to get you later because I'm going to see you. Right. <laughs> but this plan yeah. is still going and I got to make sure mm -hmm. my girl Trina is good. And I think right. that like that is what we see Eden McCoy bring out of that character, which mm -hmm. is like this combination of both parents. And it's in the looks. It's in the way she like, like holds herself. Um, and I think it's... Uh, it is, it's some really great choices that are being made there um, that, that differentiates her from Carly. Mm -hmm. Now, I totally agree. And it's amazing. Now, another favorite thing of mine this week was Vanna, but I want to allow Sandra to tell about it because we know she's team Vanna 100%. So tell us, Sandra, <laughs> what did you think? Or maybe you have something else, but I'm pretty sure you're screaming in your head. <laughs> I'm happy to start there. Thank you. Thank you for queuing that up. Um, wow, my God, that was phenomenal. Um, so of course we had them, you know, we had a little bit of lead up on Monday, but Tuesday was Vanna Day. And um, I was literally screaming every single beat. 
like I had to do that to regulate my nervous system because I was so overwhelmed by how good they were. Um, James Patrick Stewart just has this way of being like smooth and shameless when he's flirting and it's like so ridiculously charming and I want to hate it. I want to hate it, but I just can't and neither can Anna. And so like, I just was feeling that like energy from Anna of just like, why do I like this? Why? Why do I love this? Why do I love this? Like, why can't I get enough of this? Like, so much of the beginning of that conversation was exposition. It was reminding us of like, God, I'm even smearing my lipstick. I'm getting so excited. It was reminding us of like Valentine's past and a little bit about their past. But they even made this exposition like so sexy that I forgot that they were doing exposition. Like I was like, oh yeah. You did, oh yeah, the chimera. Oh yeah, mm, mm-hmm. your back surgery, yes. <laughs> I just, um, again, like I'm such a big Anna Stan, like anyone who's watched GH with me knows that like Anna is bae. And so for me to like get this, like overwhelmed by Valentine, who I actually, um didn't really I I was not down for for the longest time like I did not like him and Nina um I'm not even really sure why um like I I liked James Patrick Stewart but I was like ugh, Valentine but it was after him and Nina broke up and like he was kind of allowed to be a character that wasn't just all about tricking Nina that um I felt like free to just like enjoy him and um, also him speaking Greek to me doesn't hurt either. Um, and I, I particularly really loved Anna's line. I like you, I didn't want to, and it's getting worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, to respond, I think I am, I am definitely a Valentine fan. And I just want to remind us that early days with Nina, he was exactly the same way. He was this evil guy, but he was flirting shamelessly with Nina. And it was very like, oh my God, I hate this man. But when he talks to the woman that he's interested in, I love him. And so that combination of ambiguity is what makes me like Valentine so much. So you can have Anna and then I can have Valentine and then, you know, we'll, we'll share, but <laughs> I think, um, like that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Valentine is all of that. <laughs> I think it was hard for me. I think the difference of how I feel about, well, of course, like I have different feelings for Nina than I do for Anna, obviously, long standing feelings for Anna Devane. Um, But there's something about like, Anna is really able to hold her own with Valentine in a way that Nina just kind of like immediately was like, yeah, he's dreamy and he's only a little evil. It's fine. And like, she was just kind of always had the wool pull over her eyes. Versus Anna literally is like, I see you and I see you. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, It's my favorite moment. I I mean, y'all named it obviously that Esme line. I lost it. And I was like, I actually, that's something I would say. Like, did I write that? Like minding your business is free. Minding mine will cost you. Like just, oh, I loved it. Um, And then I think, Obviously, the really hot kiss that I talked about with Valentine and Anna, but also, like, this idea, like, Anna really talking about, as far as the exposition goes, like, in the ways that she hasn't, like, that she's, like, been compromised, and part of the way that they, what they've done really well with Anna is make her a character that is complicated that you still root for. Like, she's not all one thing, and I really think that, like, that is the thing that makes, like, soap heroines, that it's not just a damsel in distress, and it's not just a person who will save you, but it's a person who will save you at all costs, and those costs sometimes get complicated. Um, and so I appreciate it, and appreciated her talking about that with Valentine, and Valentine being the one who could understand that. Um, because he's also complicated. Um, And the other thing about Valentine is he just softens with the women he's around. You know, like, in addition to Nina and to Anna, like, 
the relationship with Charlotte softens him um, and makes him somebody who even despite, I mean, Valentin literally threw, me, uh, threw Ava off the turret. Like he literally threw her off and you were like, damn, he really threw her off there. And then like after that, he went in the, in the house and was like really sweet to Charlotte. And you were like, okay, I get why I still kind of like this guy. I don't know if y'all remember the, the time when uh, he was going to kidnap Charlotte and then Anna was the one who like talked him down from that. Um, it, it, you know, like that is who Valentin is, complicated and messy and Cassidy and Elena's kid. And also somebody who is so damn smooth, you're like, I can't help but love it. I mm -hmm. love it. <laughs> I think that might actually have been a turning point moment for me for um, being into Valentin and Anna was like that actually that exchange between them and um, their connection and like her being like, I know you, I know you're a good father. And I know that you'll actually find a way out of this. So why don't you just go ahead and cooperate? I really like that moment. I mean, speaking of that, Sandra, like what do you want to see more of? Oh, Lord. My teens, I know we got a lot of them and I want more. Um, just every time it's a teen episode, I'm just like, I love my kids. <laughs> what kind of messy shit are they gonna get up to this week? Um, I really think Nicholas Chavez did just such a phenomenal job this week. I mean, I think the, that first, like the Windermere party week, he did a really excellent job and got a lot of props. But this week, really, like, um, he had really, really beautiful scenes with Cam. Um, there was just like a really lovely vulnerability with Cam. And we've seen moments of it before. But we usually only really see him being vulnerable with Trina. Um, and so it was nice to kind of like see their relationship between Spencer and Cam like deepen a little bit. And it, you know, kind of like Laura finally got her wish about her grandsons connecting for now. Cause obviously there's gonna be drama down the line. Um, but I, I also just really thought William Lipton did a great job in those scenes too. And like, he seems to do really well in scenes with Spencer. And I loved when he said, no matter what you did, I'll always be there for you. I was like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting to be so moved. And I had been talking so much shit on Cam. I was just like, oh, sweet, simple Cam. And this week I'm calling him, I'm going to go back to calling him sweet, simple Sam uh, Cam because he's obviously gonna do some naive shit later. But this week I'm calling him compassionate Cam. And, um, and it was also kind of interesting. He was like talking out of both sides of his mouth. Like he was both telling Spencer, like, I'm there for you. Trina doesn't need to know because, you know, Trina's like really actually the only person that Spencer cares about finding out that he's the stalker. Um, so he's like against the plot. Then he's like all in on the plot. He thinks Spencer should pay. He thinks Spencer deserves compassion. Um, he wants Spencer to trust him, but he also wants, you know, he's going to tell Trina Spencer's business. So I think there's also something about like Cam being the audience in that moment where it's like, oh, Spencer, I really want you to be found out. And oh, poor baby, are you going to be okay? Um, yeah, that was, that was top for me. I, I, I think that all the teens in general, like had great contributions this week. Like as you y'all spoke to Joss and her, um, I think like, I really appreciated that she was just a hundred percent in like, let's take these bitches out <laughs> in a way that like that voice needed to be represented. And I think it also, there's some foreshadowing about the conflict between that's to come between Joss and Cam, both about this approach, but also like there's some personality conflict there too that I think will be interesting to explore. Cause like Joss was really just like gleeful and Cam looked like he was gonna throw up. And so, and like she didn't even really notice that that was happening. So I, I am also just excited to see more of their dynamic now that we see that Esme has her sights set on compassionate Cameron. 
your cute boyfriend Cameron is what she mm-hmm. said to Jocelyn. <laughs> And they had that moment at Windermere where Spencer was like, what's going on here? So I'm I, excited to see that play out. Yeah, I, I think that that's absolutely right. And I, and I do, I think that so much, so many, so many times with the teens, like the person that we see shine because she's put in that position is, um, is Trina, which is why we love Trina. But like, to your point, seeing every single one of them have something to do, have like a way that they stood out. Um, and with the compassionate cam, I mean, you know, Sandra, we are obsessed with this and we got to continue to talk about the fact that Lucky ain't shit. Where is your daddy? Where is your daddy, Kim? That is your dad. Spencer is your cousin. <laughs> it's not just that we are friends. People are like, you, they're like, oh, well, you know, they don't really share. Spencer is named after <laughs> after Lucky. Like, this is about the connection between the Cassidy and Spencer family. Like, that is what Spencer's name is, is represents. And in that conversation that they had where he was like, you know, my dad and this and that, or me and Franco, I just really don't understand the writers not saying, and my dad Lucky abandoned me. Like, I just don't get it. Like, I feel like that would make it so much richer. And I don't know if it's just, um, if it's on purpose that the writers aren't doing this. It's just like a throwaway. Like, what is it? But it's really frustrating as somebody who, like, has been watching and remembered Lucky bonding with Cam when he was born. To even bring back Xander as Cam's dad, I was like, stop it. That's not his daddy. Like, let's quit playing. So, like, to to not have them talk about Lucky as Cam's dad in that moment where it's so relevant, um, it just was like really frustrating. Yeah, it was a really big missed opportunity and it felt like such a big ball drop. And I don't know like why that choice has been made to ignore that history because Lucky really did raise, like Lucky is the only man that Kim has ever called dad. Like there have been other men in his life that have been father figures, but like Franco was his stepdad. And that's not to say that that can't be just as meaningful of a relationship. Absolutely. But like when someone raises you from, you know, childhood and then they abandon you, I think that's some, you know, it's worth revisiting as you're becoming a young adult and you're talking to your cousin who shares, um, you know, that deadbeat dad vibe. Yeah, I want to respond to the whole camp thing because I want to agree with you. First of all, that conversation between Spencer and Cam made me like Cam more. Yes. And (laughs) because he's offering himself to Spencer to be that confidant, which last week I was thinking would be with Sonny, but it was it's actually with Cameron. And I also want to acknowledge that. Cameron had reservations about the plan, rightfully so, because see how it blew up in their face. <laughs> and but and and at the time I was watching it, I was a little annoyed at the teens because look at all the drama that they caused, but they were successful. And I had to remember these are teenagers, right? They're not going to do something sophisticated and perfect. They're, I mean, yeah, they're in college, but they still, again, like you had mentioned their their brains aren't 100 percent formulated right so even when they're trying to do good they're going to do something really stupid uh but and cameron was right because he was like y'all i don't know if we should do this are you sure you want to do this and then what i liked is that i think what he was doing with cameron or with spencer is offering himself up as a confidant even outside of the the girls. I think he was actually trying to get Spencer to tell him what was happening. And he deviated from the plan when he did it. And so he was more concerned about Spencer in that moment than he was in outing him. And that made me like him more. So I totally agree with you. It's not the one that I, it's not the moment that I wanna see more of, but I just wanted to comment on that because I think it's really pivotal. Yeah. Yeah. What's your I, moment? I like, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, was, I felt like I I believed him actually in that right. moment. I was like, I think that you really would at least pause before telling Trina 
or like try to convince Spencer, okay, you need to come clean. Mm -hmm. And, and about the mess of the plan, it's what I love the most about it. It was such a disaster. It was always (laughs) going to be a disaster. Like Trina was like, let's bait these people who we think blew up this car into doing something else. And like with a plan that could have fallen apart at any moment because it involved like all Spencer needed to do was talk to Nicholas. And in fact, it would have fallen apart even faster had Esme not talked to Sunny because Nicholas would have arrived home and and Spencer could have been like, Bora Bora? What? Um, <laughs> right. So it's, like, it's like part of what I loved about it because yes, they're teens. Also like Trina doesn't have to be the perfect mastermind all the time. She's always like cleaning up other people's messes, including adult messes. Like I love that she actually just created her own because she was panicking. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I also loved that in the end, it was actually like they put all these things in motion, but what actually ended up working was that um was just like Spencer's sense of um loyalty to Trina and to Cam was like oh like they're about to get in trouble when whenever Nicholas was like you two need to apologize to Spencer Spencer looked like he was about to puke like he was just like oh god no and so I I really love that it that the plan didn't work and that it was so chaotic, like the energy in the room was so chaotic um, and that it was ended up being, again, like Spencer's care for, for Cam, but like mostly for Trina, mm-hmm. that ended up doing him in. Agreed. And I heard your question, Tracy. So I think you're probably wondering what my favorite moment is or mm-hmm. what I wanna see more of. Um, when the Cynthia, the, when the Nina, Nina and Carly confrontation happened, what I enjoyed most, which a little annoyed me, but now that I look back on it, I enjoyed it the most was how defiant Nina was in the face of Carly's wrath. Like she was just like, she was all kinds of wrong. And she knew she was all kinds of wrong. But she was like looking at Carly, like Carly's the one that's crazy. <laughs> and, it, and I loved it. I love that energy of F you. And I'm going, and, and you're the one who owes me an apology. And I was just like, girl, <laughs> like she don't owe you Jack, but you came with that energy. And I love it. And it's like, cause she's not going to back down in front of Carly. And most people would be hella intimidated by that righteous anger but Nina was just like "Mm." and I loved it I love that she's not gonna go down you know scared and you know pushed I think she's gonna continue to fight and she may be apologetic to Michael she may be apologetic to Jocelyn but like she said I'm not gonna apologize to you (laughs) I was like right then uh so I love that Um, So I want to see more of that. I want to see more of Nina, you know, giving it to Carly and not giving any fucks about it. (laughs) That's what I want to see. So that was great. Um, But Tracy, what do you want to see less of? Um, (laughs) So many things. Uh, (laughs) No, uh, I do want to say something about that. It looked like Sandra wanted to say something about the Carly thing too. Because one of the things I was saying is that it really felt like watching tennis. Like it was not because so often, and this is like the hard part about Carly. And I think, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the backlash that she gets is that she is like this kind of like, you know, people back down to her and are scared of her. Even like the way Nell was like portrayed was like, not as like a sympathetic figure to Carly, but like just a foil to Carly. Um, And so I appreciate that Nina is not that. She was giving as good as she gets. And like, I, in this conversation, I'm definitely team Carly. I think Nina was wild (laughs) and to believe that she was anything else is wild, but Carly needs some, like it makes Carly more interesting to have somebody who she can go toe to toe with. Having Carly run roughshod over somebody is not fun. So to like watch Maxie be like, you know what? Nina was wrong, but Carly, have you always been right? And and I actually still really loved her. 
having Scott be like, girl, you know Carly coming for you, so here's my card. Like, that, I think, made, like, really, um, was really, really important to the story. Like, it's really important that Carly doesn't just get to run all over people, even though, like I said, I just want to be clear that in this situation, I'm seeing Carly. Sandra, like, you had something. Oh, I mean, yeah, what you said about, the, like, Nina being able to meet Carly at her level of crazy. I think that Nina's also in the past shown that like, especially I think we saw this more um, with the last actresses, Nina, of just like, I don't care if I'm wrong, I'm right. Like, I don't care if I'm like, the, her interactions with Willow, for example, like, um, she just gets that tunnel vision. And if, you, if she's like challenged too openly and I, I'm, I'm really glad to see that show up. I'm also, I'm like, you know, I'm so neutral in the situation too. Like I'm not really rooting for anyone in particular. I'm just rooting for mess. So I'm, I'm team mess in this situation. And as long as this storyline continues to actually have like messy moments, I can be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like when um, Michelle um, Stafford was playing um, Nina, definitely that crazy side was out. And Michelle is really great about playing that that type of character she does it so well when it comes to Phyllis on you young and the restless um so it, it was always yeah you know that that toe-to-toe -to -toe. and I didn't necessarily see that in Cynthia Watro's portrayal of Nina but now it's coming out and I'm loving it and enjoying it and I hope she keeps it up yeah I think if I'm talking about like what I want to see more of and less of like slash slash what I want to see more of is Esme. Like, she's a mess. She's giving us the mess that we deserve. Um, she is, that actress is delivering. And I think that it is really important that when those actors, like, are delivering, we, like, lift that up because so many of them are getting, like, real backlash to, like, storylines, which is very concerning to me. I'm like, why are y'all going after Cynthia Watcher? Leave that woman alone. Like leave this woman alone, and I and I appreciate that. Like the team seem to like um, rally around this actress that plays Esme um, because she's doing an amazing job. Um, and just to see her go toe to toe with Jocelyn, um, to see uh, Kevin be shady to her, amazing, amazing moment. Kevin was like, "Why don't you ask yourself like that?" I loved it, um, and I want to see more of that. And I also want to see. Um, her bring out some more of that crazy in Ava because Ava's a mom queen and we have forgotten that in this relationship with Nicholas but like Ava will come for you and I think that we're going to see some of that and and then to pivot into what we want to see less of I want to see less of whatever the story however they're doing the storyline with Leo um, I think there is some really powerful and beautiful story to be told here and right now they're not doing it I don't want to see Leo's diagnosis be used like a pawn in this Quartermain storyline. Um, and hopefully with Austin telling Brooklyn, like, I'm not trying to use this baby, um, that we can actually get into like, what the like actual nuance of what it means to raise a child with special needs, as opposed to like it being, I just think that it deserves more than, um, and then what it's given, and they know how to do it because they do it with, with Sunny's storyline, with Sunny's bipolar disorder because Maurice Bernard is there, they know how to do it. And so I don't want to see autism get, get used in this like way um, that just doesn't honor like the children living with it, with the families who are living with it and like the really like beautiful um, ways that families are able to like navigate and create and love each other with, with this so um, that is really concerning to me and I don't want to see any more of it what about y'all oh I mean yes to that I was actually on my list of of what I want to see less of like I want to see more of this actual like storyline but the kind of like back and forth between Ned and Olivia has been disturbing I don't like that Ned is the reasonable one. It feels like, I don't know, it feels like throwing Olivia under the bus when I feel like she's actually the kind of mother who would be really attentive to her child and make sure, like advocate for her child. And it's not to say, you know, like I don't want also wanna, 
you know, demonize people who do struggle with their child's diagnosis. I don't know. I just don't, it feels like they're using the story to like redeem Ned. And like this Ned is such an asshole. Like I miss Eddie May Ned, to be honest. Um, but he's probably too old for that. But I, I, I agree with you, Tracy. It, the storyline's like rubbing me the wrong way. Yeah, when you think about it that way, um, I agree. They do know how to do storylines right. And I think one storyline that they didn't really do well with was looking at um, Elizabeth's son and the fact that he likes to do cooking and he likes to do some other stuff. I feel like they were going somewhere with that and they kind of dropped the ball and just said, oh, he just likes to cook. And I was like, okay <laughs> so I was like okay you you brought me to a place and then you dropped me and I didn't appreciate that I think um I would have preferred um with the scene with Ned and Leo if um Olivia was there and she could see what Ned is seeing because I think then she would have been like okay, maybe this isn't normal. Or she could have been more angry or something. I don't know. But I think it would have served more if she was there. And it would have been more about Leo than it would have been about Austin. Because when she's making it about Austin, then that trivializes what's going on. And so I would, I don't know if it's like something I'd see less. Of. Yeah, I guess I agree. I would like to see less of it being about Austin and more about being Leo. Um, I didn't have a particular what I'd like to see less of topic because um, er everything this week was amazing. I guess I wasn't necessarily paying as much attention to the Alexis Sean dynamic. I, I guess if I really wanted to be honest, I don't want to see um, Alexis and Sean <laughs> together. <laughs> I don't want to see that. Um, I rather, you know, I get, and maybe it's a filler while they wait to um, recast Jordan. Cause I would like to see Jordan and Sean together um, personally. Um, but cause I think Jordan and Sean had more chemistry. I think they're trying to force chemistry on Alexis and Sean. And I don't, I don't like it. Um, so that's where I am at. Yeah. I mean, it's like, we've been done, been there, done that with Alexis and Sean before. And it was like, it was like a cute moment. Like it wasn't anything spectacular. I don't, I don't understand why we're revisiting it now. It just feels strange. Like they still don't know what to do with Nancy Legron. Um, I don't know, like, can she do something else in camp prison? I don't know. Um, I would say that the really the only besides the, the autism storyline, um, I just, I would love, I no more Jibrit, no more Jason and Brit. And it's not that I didn't like them the, like the first time around. It's like, it's just been ruined. And, um, I like Brit. I don't need, actually don't need Jason to redeem her. Um, and I, I think that if they, and I'm okay with like the, they're with them making her have more friends at the hospital, but like, can't her redemption be through her friendship with Terry and not through this man who has like one facial expression i'm just i'm just tired of him i'm just tired of him anyway that's it uh <laughs> and you know those um the scene breakdowns came through um or with the different characters for the month of september and then people also did the breakdowns for the year and of course, people are very upset about how much Carly there is. Personally, I'm quite upset about how much Jason there is, but to each their own. And I'm sorry to those of you who are tired of Carly, because we're about to talk to her about her some more. Tracy has prepared our next deep dive into our 2003 classic storyline, Carly in the Panic Room. Take it away. Boom. Thanks, Sandra. So I think, you know, one of the things I think that's really important to remember about like soaps and fandom, especially even when we do all this exposition and get annoyed by it, 
is that so much of what we're connected to to the storylines is like how we entered the show. So like, I personally don't really like Elizabeth because I entered at this time. So the Carly Panic Room um, was like one of my first entrances to GH. And so I understand people who have like watched since they were teens, like saw the like Liz and Lucky like falling in love storyline, like really love her from that. Um, that's not my experience. <laughs> and it's also not my experience. I mean, like I like Sarah Brown. I went back and watched those and I understood like what Car- who Carly was, but Tamara Brown was my first Carly. Um, and so I just think that like when we talk about storylines and characters that people like and who people root for, it's important to remember where they came in. So I understand Sarah Brown was obviously iconic. Um, I think that she had amazing chemistry with Maurice Bernard, but I also think that Tamara Braun did too. Um, so coming back uh, to 2003 with me, um, Liz was dating Rick, Sonny's half-brother. Jason was dating Courtney, and Carly is pregnant with Morgan. So Faith Roscoe is obsessed with Rick, which, I mean, I get it, Rick was kind of cute, and pushes a pregnant Elizabeth down the st- uh, stairs, causing her to miscarriage, uh, have a miscarriage. So a little bit of a little misunderstanding and a little delusion led Rick to think that Sonny is responsible instead. So Rick, what does he do? He buys a house with a panic room uh, for him and Liz and plots his revenge. Um, so at what would have been Courtney and Jason's uh, wedding, uh, Carly is snatched by Rick. Michael sees it, but nobody, so this is little redheaded Michael, um, sees it, but nobody believes him besides Jason uh, because everybody knows that Jason hates Rick. And so they were like, oh, Jason said that Rick took Carly. So therefore Michael is repeating that. Um, if you were a little bit back from that, um, there was a point where Carly thought that Rick, that Morgan might be Rick's kid because Rick had convinced Carly that they slept together. Uh, But what really happened was that he drugged her, got her into bed. And then when she woke up, he was like laying beside her. Um, They never had sex, but Rick was trying to make her believe that they did. So she found out the truth through a paternity test. So kind of fast forward, um, Jason has always wanted to kill Rick because of that. And the only reason he didn't is because Rick um, exposed to Sonny that they had the same mom. So Rick holds Carly uh, in the panic room and plans to keep her there, making her give birth and giving the baby to Elizabeth. Um, Rick also does this wild shit where he hides birth control in Elizabeth's food so that she cannot become pregnant herself. In the panic room, there's a monitor, a TV monitor where Carly watches everything. Um, She also sees like attempts by Jason to rescue her um, and all of that. Um, And Jason puts Rick's house under surveillance. So everybody thinks Jason is wild. They're like, he didn't do it. Sonny thinks that Jason's obsessed, all of that. Um, Jason obviously turns out to be right. Um, Lorenzo Alcazar, if you remember him, finds out about Carly being held. Um, And so he convinces Sonny that Carly is being held in Central America um, and he'll use his contacts to get her back if Sonny lets him use the docks. So Lorenzo is an arms dealer. I know that we've never found out what Sonny actually like does besides coffee. And I really would like to know, like I in my fan fiction and my headcanon think that Sonny sells like fake Birkin bags. And so like, that's what Jason is like out here hawking on the corner is like, he's hawking fake Birkin. But anyway, um, so Sonny also has to like work with the feds and Faith Roscoe at the time because Faith is in jail. Um, and Sonny works with her to like try to capture other criminals. So like the, the feds come in for this. Um, and so Sonny has to pretend that he's having this affair with Faith. And Carly is seeing some of this on the screen in the panic room as she's watching the news. Um, so this like all wraps up. Sonny insists that Jason stops surveilling Rick. Elizabeth finds the button that opens the soundproof room and sees Carly. She's shocked and also off balance because of the birth control Rick is giving her. Um, So she passes out before they can call anybody. So Rick runs in and is like, oh my God, he takes her to the hospital. He knows that she's seen Carly. So in his delusion, he's about to kill Elizabeth, but he's like, you know what? I love her, I can't. So he goes home, lets Carly call Sunny. Um, to be like, come get me. And Alcazar finds this out. And so before Jason and Sonny can get to Carly, 
Alcazar kidnaps her. So when they show up, they show up to find Carly gone and Rick knocked out. So there's a lot more to the story. There's a lot of after to the story um, around like Carly giving birth to Morgan. If people remember, like um, Alcazar falls in love with Carly. Um, when she's giving birth to Morgan, Sonny comes in, Alcazar is there. He shoots Alcazar, but also shoots Carly in the head. And she gets amnesia or she forgets like, or not amnesia, but she stops having like an attachment, an emotional attachment to her family. So she has the attachment to Alcazar. It's a mess. It was soapy. It was delicious. I loved it. And this was my entrance into GH. Um, so I'm going to stop there because um, I want to hear what y'all think about it. And I really want to hear like what y'all think are like lasting ripple effects from the storyline um, and why the storyline was important. Why was Rick giving Elizabeth the birth control pills? I don't remember. He was cray cray. He didn't want her to get pregnant. I don't know yeah. what it, it was something. I don't remember why um, in the videos. It's not clear, but he didn't want her to get pregnant. So yeah. that he give her Carly's baby? I'm yeah, so I, I think his goal was like, if, if she got pregnant herself, then she would want her own baby and wouldn't feel the need to adopt another one, which would probably be how he would give her Carly's baby by saying, oh, this baby needs to be adopted. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Carly the craziest part of the plan, but uh, you know, no, he, gotta find no. a to give Elizabeth these birth control pills. Right. Um, yeah, I think, ooh, I need to think about how this um, story kind of reverberates to, the, to now. Um, but I do have to say this was my one of my favorite storylines in my entire career of watching, I call it a career, of watching General Hospital. Um, because I I was it was it was enthralling to have Carly literally chained up inside the panic room and seeing her desperate attempts to get out and having Elizabeth, I was so pissed at Elizabeth. And what you had said though, would, you know, would be like, okay, she has a reason. Um, Rick drugged her, Rick did this, Rick did that. But there were so many things that she could have done differently. And, and to this day, I'm pissed about it. And I don't think there was adequate restorative justice <laughs> I hate to use a term about it like she may have had one scene where she's like oh Carly I'm so sorry but it it meant nothing by the time that Carly was actually rescued <laughs> and um I I don't think people acknowledge Elizabeth's role in the kidnapping as much as they should have um because I think maybe people felt bad that Rick was gaslighting her and all this good stuff I'm like yeah but Elizabeth being Elizabeth also contributed <laughs> to the kidnapping like her refusal to believe that you know Carly needed rescuing her refusal to believe that she Carly is a victim in this and you know her sanctimonious attitude towards Carly um contributed to the kidnapping almost as much as Rick himself. So, and I think, I guess if we look at it today, I think even the audience has that same attitude towards Carly where they're so antagonized by her <laughs> that they don't wanna see her. <laughs> and they don't, you know, they have a sanctimonious attitude about her. And so having it be the Carly show is annoying to them. And also kind of visiting that feeling onto Laura Wright, which I also think is unfair. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm team Carly all the way. And she's also a very dysfunctional, and like she said today, and she said this week, I've committed a lot of heinous mistakes that I need to and have apologized for, but I did not deserve what happened here with Sunny. And I agree. I do not believe that. And, and she deserved to have Sunny taken away from her for nine months. 
I don't agree that even though I love it, I love that Nina is like, you owe me an apology. I don't think she owes me an apology. Um, so yeah, I thank you for bringing that story back. And it's, it's not like I haven't revisited because I continue every time I go on a YouTube binge, that storyline is always my go-to because it was so poignant. Um, yeah. I, I was one of the people that loved Elizabeth um, as like a teenager and like watched her introduction and like watched her and Lucky Fall Love in the Boxcar. Um, and this was one of the moments where I started to be like, what's going on with Elizabeth? Like, what's she doing? Um, I think, and there are of course things that happen after that that were questionable, but then like when she gets back together with Rick right before the Drew, Jason, like Billy Miller storyline or like right as that was starting, I was like, excuse me, what? With Rick? With Panic Room Rick? You're getting back together with Panic Room Rick. Okay. This is who you want to like step parent your children, Rick. Rick Lansing. I mean, he's cute, but nobody's that cute. I know we've. I know people have done some pretty heinous things, and they go on to find love, and we ship them. Currently shipping them, Valentine. Um, but you know, keeping a pregnant woman in your panic room while I'm living in the house and you're giving me birth control pills. Like that's too, that's just, that's just too far for me. Um, so I, I, I just think with Elizabeth, I'm not really sure like what the core of her character is a lot of the time. Like, I just feel like there's just a lot of things happening in her story and she's like with a lot of different people and she's having kids with, with some of them. And I, I feel like this was one of the moments where I'm like, I'm not sure who Elizabeth is anymore. And I'm not really sure, like for me that I've ever really gotten a good sense of who she is since this moment. So I think that's one of the ripple effects for me. Um, was like my relationship, my personal relationship to Elizabeth. I so agree because I feel like she has this attitude of sanctimonious, sanct or just being feeling like she's a better person than Carly, but she's not. And that will never go away. And it, it extends itself not only to Carly, but to Britt. She feels that she's better than Britt. And she's done some pretty heinous things, you know, <laughs> with Nicholas, with some other people, but she still feels that she's better than Brit. And that's something that is hard for me to get over. And kudos to, you know, Rebecca Hertz. I'm sorry. I mean, she's really good at making me hate Elizabeth as a person. <laughs> and, but I always like want to continue to acknowledge that the actors are not the character. And Rebecca is amazing for having me have such strong feelings about her character. <laughs> Cause I'm just like, I can't, I can't with you right now. Um, but yeah, that, that is a ripple effect of the storyline is that I feel like Elizabeth is the biggest hypocrite on the planet and she continues to be so despite how many times she herself messes up and doesn't seem to connect her attitude with that, so. I mean, I think that the other thing to bring back to Sandra's point about, it's not just the Drew Jason storyline where Elizabeth is gonna get back with Rick. It was before that, it was right a little bit after the panic room because one of the things Elizabeth loves to do is some paternity bullshit. She got pregnant by Xander and she was going to pass the baby off as Rick's. So it's not just like, you know, <clears throat> 10 years later, five years later, whatever, she's, she wanted to get back with Rick. She wants to get back with him pretty immediately and then pretend like a baby that wasn't his was his. So it's not, you know, and, and that I think also in the immediate, before that, when when they thought that, that Rick had like assaulted Carly, Elizabeth like slept shamed her and was like, actually, we know who Carly is. She probably wanted it. So that was one. That was my intro to Liz. Like I was like, what? Is, people like this person? And then after the fact, when Jason, so they knew that Alcazar had taken Carly from the panic room 
And so they had to pretend like they were going to kill Rick. So they had to like take him. And so Elizabeth came back and thought Rick had been killed and was going to go to the police and tell on Sonny and Jason. And I'm like, okay, but you know that that he kidnapped this pregnant woman and had her chained to a wall. And I'm just trying to understand like how your first thing was like, you also need to be punished. You know what I'm saying? Like that was like, so for me, again, that's like been a ripple effect of how I feel about Elizabeth. I'll say the other things that I kind of pulled out was, I've said this before, that Carly doesn't really have female friends. Um, and this was like, I think, an illustration of that. I mean, he, she had Courtney, and part of the reason that her and Courtney were so tight is because she still had like this like full run of Jason's life um, that she was able to like have um, with her best friend being Courtney. Um, it cemented like Sunny, Carly, and Jason as like the the front of the show, um, it, and I and I think that there was a misunderstanding from the writers of like having a really good storyline that made them people want them to be center front and center versus them being characters that people wanted to always see. Um, it also I think you know I call it like a Carly fatigue. She's everywhere at all times, um, and they don't know how to make her part of the uh, ensemble. As my fave from Schitt's Creek, Maura Rose would say, ensemble is when one of us shines, all of us shines. And that's actually not what happens with Carly. And they actually know how to do that better because to our point, you know, we continue to stand the teens. This is why the teen scene is so interesting. It is continuing to get more interesting that it's not just about one character or another because it's very, it could have been very easily for them, easy for them to say, okay, Eden McCoy, that's Joss, that's Carly and Jason's, uh, Jason, ooh, sorry, Carly and Jack's yeah. kid. <laughs> Woo, uh, Carly and Jax's kid. And so therefore, like, she's going to be the one who gets all of the shine. And we saw a little bit around the storyline with Oscar, right? Like, that she was, like, the one and everybody was kind of a supporting actor in that show. But after that, the rest of them got storylines. That's what makes the teen scene interesting. And that's actually what the adult scene is kind of missing and why it's a little bit, bit mediocre aside from Vanna is that we're not seeing an ensemble. Um, and I think that that's really unfortunate because to, to Tanya's point, like there's some hate for Laura Wright. And I just don't understand why people think she has like this full run of the writer's room. Sonny, or Maurice Bernard has said he hated playing Sonny, that he hates Sonny as a character. And so if any, like if, if Maurice Bernard doesn't have full run of the writer's room, it's hard for me to believe that Laura Wright would. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that um, that point that you made around the writers, like kind of running with this Jason Carly, Sunny trio and not understanding that even like all things that we love, we need a break from sometimes. And um, yeah, those, the the actor scene or the episode breakdown was really like, whoo, eye-opening. Um, and made me sad. I mean, even like, I will say, I, I'm also not an Elizabeth fan. Look, look at this alignment here. Um, but, I will say like, I was a little like, okay, I understand why Elizabeth fans are upset. Like she has not had a story in forever that wasn't actually, that wasn't um, about her, about someone else's business. Like whether that's like the Peter weird murder that wasn't a murder or even like all of her storylines um, with Franco were like mostly about Franco and his reputation and all of that. And while, I think him and uh, Roger Howarth and, and uh, Becky Hurst had a really lov lovely chemistry. It's not the same as her actually having a story, but seeing those like episode breakdowns, I was like, damn, like I don't even like Elizabeth and they're, they're doing her wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that also, oh, go no, I'm talking about that, Tanya. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a dynamic that they could go after with Elizabeth. The fact that her parents abandoned her long ago and they still abandon her and they have nothing to do with her life is a story. And I and I, I also just to bring bring back some sympathy to Elizabeth. Um, she was introduced to GH as a young teen and she was raped. There could be some definitely some residuals around all of that that they can bring back. Um, 
so yeah she doesn't necessarily she's playing a supportive player and that is a shame she's still on the canvas because there's a lot of people who aren't on the canvas who have nothing um, but and she's still kind of key um so yeah i i still i don't i don't know what they could do to kind of redeem her character in my eyes <laughs> But at the same time, I don't hate it. I don't hate that she's in the story. I don't hate that she's on the show. She's uh, probably one of those people that you kind of love to hate somewhat. <laughs> um, so that's fine. Um, and, and if she's a foil to Brit, that's fine too. Um, but yeah. And I think that in addition to that, it just shows why other storylines are moving so slowly. So like, it's hard to get invested in like a Sam and a Dante because we haven't seen them. Like we didn't see them at all this week. So I think the Sam and Dante have like a nice chemistry. I wouldn't mind, but I'm actually bored. I don't care anymore. And that happens because we haven't seen them. Um, and I feel like when I was like looking back at the Panic Room stuff and like looking at some other storylines, we we need that we need people to like be on the screen for us to care about them you can't like depend on them being legacy you can't depend on them having their own individual fan bases it's actually not fair to the couple um it's the same thing with michael and willow i mean i'm not a Milo person by any means i think they're boring and i think that like if, if we had to invest all this time in them being together why are they not there i guess next week we're supposed to see then maybe with the Nina stuff, I think that we saw that in the preview um, for Monday's episode, but like give them a storyline, give them something to do. I, I I actually feel a little bit bad for the actress that plays Willow because once they got her with Michael, she just didn't, she wasn't really on the canvas anymore. Like what is there for her to do? We don't see her being the nurse that she was trying to be. I guess that they're like bringing Harmony on, so maybe she'll have more scenes with her mom, but there's just a lacking, um, that they can no longer blame on COVID um, that it's happening with like not having people on the campus. If you had, Carly is on five days a week. If you had three and a half days of Carly and had another, you know, whatever, you know, even Elizabeth's scenes this week, it was like middle school. It was like, do you think a Finn likes me? Let's see if I can like deliver him this letter. There's, let's do something more interesting here, y'all. Like it, it wasn't good. It's just not good. It's just not good. <laughs> well so, do you have any wrap up oh go ahead oh, yeah go ahead. go ahead no I was gonna yeah go ahead <laughs> I was gonna ask if y'all had anything more about the panic room or or the or Carly or anything else that y'all want to say about um this is frivolous but I love Carly's hair <laughs> oh yeah always like no matter how tired I am of the storyline her hair is, is amazing yeah during during the funeral scenes and I think she had this interesting cut. I was actually trying to copy her haircut <laughs> and I couldn't quite do it. And then I was watching some, they did some interviews with Laura Wright and she said that she actually did it herself and it came out a little wonky, but it looked amazing. And I think that was the best that I've seen her hair ever be. Now it's growing back a little longer, but still it's amazing. I, I just, uh, I love it. <laughs> We could definitely have a Carly hair and wardrobe appreciation because she looks bomb. Oh, um, I her outfit this week too. I love that. You know, the kind of suit jacket and the jeans. I love that she's kind of going back to her, you know, almost casual self. Maybe that's her Sunday outfit, but I love it. Because <laughs> we're still like one day in. So, I mean, you know what I mean? Like the wedding was yesterday or some stupid shit. Um, Sandra. I feel like you be doing these prediction things. Like you predict some shit and it'll happen. So I'm trying to hear your predictions. I don't want to hear no spoilers. I want to hear Sandra predictions. Well, you know, I've been spoiler free for weeks now, which has been a big sacrifice so that I can do these predictions from a place of integrity. Um, it has meant unfollowing some people who I really enjoy. Sorry, friends. Um, but here we go. My predictions are like basically all about the teens. I mean, like, you know, 
Valentine obviously is getting kidnapped. So him and Anna are going to be split up for a while. And it's all going to be about Anna trying to find him and all that. So that's like my prediction on that. I'm, I'm disappointed, but I'm, I'm okay with the sacrifice of like all the juicy bananas from this week. But as far as the teens, um, my babies. Um, so I think Cam believes that Spencer actually was the real mastermind behind the stalking. I think he believes that Esme was just following Spencer's orders. Um, there was a lot of like zooming in, like reaction shots of Cam reacting to stuff about Esme this week. So it's just like more hints being laid. Obviously Jocelyn's not buying that shit at all. And so there's gonna be tension between them and eventually Esme will at least try and it probably succeed in coming between them. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that because I think it's honestly the best thing that could happen to Cam and Joss's relationship because I, they really botched getting them together. Like they didn't have, they had drama but it wasn't real drama. Um, and it took so long for them to get together. And then it was just, I was very confused about the pacing and the choices of that storyline. And now that I see this with Esme, I'm like, okay, I understand now what y'all are doing. Um, that being said, I think Spencer and Esme are gonna stay together for now. Um, they both just, they have too much leverage um, over the other to walk away from the relationship. Like it's very like Machiavellian, like, <laughs> Um, but I do see her loosening her barnacle grip on him because she's going to get more focused on um, her real reasons for being in Port Charles. We're going to see more of her at Spring Ridge. We're going to see more of her interfering with Joss and Cam. So um, I think that Spencer's also going to be more wary of her. Like I'm interested to see her their fallout over her telling that lie to Sunny that ended up blowing their cover. Um, and also her reaction to him confessing. I'm sure it's not going to be as uh, compassionate as Trina's. And I think between that and camera, Cameron like planting that seed that Esme has Spencer in her thrall, like Spencer's going to slowly start to wise up, but not fast enough to, you know, throw her under the bus about blowing up Ava's car. I think Spencer and Trina will have some one-on-one -on -one interaction soon. This is a this is a prediction and a hope because it's been over a month um, since they've been one-on-one. -on -one. So now that the truth is out in the open, they have a lot to talk about. And in, in one of their last scenes on the turret, he asks her like, would you hate me if I had been the one who was the stalker? And that's like a theme that keeps coming up over and over again. Like he brought it, you know, he named that to Cam. He's like, it's one thing for me to tell you my shit, but it's another thing for Trina to know because she's actually a good person. Um, and all the different ways in which like Spencer talks up, Trina's so good. And Esme saying like, oh, you know, she'd never forgive you. Oh, Trina must be so disappointed in you when she was, when they were having that conversation with Joss. So I think that, I, that that will be playing out this week that we actually get to see Trina's reaction to Spencer directly. And that um, I think he will be surprised at how, if not forgiving she is, how compassionate she is. Because even though she was like, I don't know him earlier in the week, like, oh, I barely know Spencer, whatever. Like she also, whenever she was witnessing um Sunny and Spencer's reunion she was all heart eyes like she was just like oh which was such a contrast to Esme's reaction which was like Ugh, this is gonna fuck up our plan so I um I'm hoping that there's gonna be some sort of scenario in the next few weeks that puts them together on an actually more consistent basis because we know that the show like if there's not a plot driven reason for characters to be together they're not and so I could see there being like a project that they're working on or like a new mystery to solve, which is what I really hope for. And that there will be a lot of longing and their relationship will continue to very slowly progress. I don't think they'll get together until the end of the year at the earliest. And speaking of reunions, uh, Nicholas and Ava will not be getting back together anytime soon. 
Ava won't want to be um, in between Nicholas and Spencer. Um, I think, you know, obviously Ava's a badass. She's going to be mad as hell. And also Kiki's death really changed her. And so I think at the end of the day, she's going to want to prioritize Nicholas and Spencer um, making up over like her and Nicholas being together. And she'll probably forgive Spencer before Nicholas does. And I think that both Nicholas and Spencer's inability to heal and like walk away from the conflict will continue to be roadblocks in both of their relationships to Ava and Trina. So those are my predictions. What do we have? <laughs> reactions other predictions i was going to talk about um sunny and spencer i was really interested in the fact that sunny pointed out to him you put my daughter at risk when you did this so i think there there might be a little a slight change in um, dynamic I'm hoping, I guess this is a hope and prediction that Spencer will do a kind of a Mia couple where he and Sonny have some alone time. Cause you know, they usually have alone time where he's coming to him and, and um, talking. And I do want to acknowledge that I, I, my last prediction was that Sonny was going to bring on the confession from Spencer, but it didn't happen the way that I thought it would. <laughs> um, but it did happen. Sonny was there. And so my wish prediction hope is that they have a one on one conversation. And I think that Sonny will forgive Spencer, but I think he's going to make Spencer realize how dangerous what he did was. And the same thing. I mean, the last time when they had a conversation and, and Spencer, fessed up to you know rigging the mail race you know Sonny was like what you're gonna do what you're doing is gonna have consequences and you need to cut it out and I'm hoping he'll do the same thing except he'll feel the consequence not necessarily from the outer world he's gonna feel Spencer's gonna feel the consequence of what he did to Sonny and that's gonna alter the relationship a little bit but I think that Sonny will end up forgiving Spencer because he's obviously has bigger fish to fry, but I think he will make sure that Spencer learns a lesson from this. And I also hope and hope that Sonny will be like, this bitch, Esme, <laughs> calling some real shit. And I think he's going to be like, you need to watch out for this bitch <laughs> right now. I, I'm hoping that's what will happen. Yeah, that's hilarious. I I have hope. I don't really have a lot of predictions other than what Sandra said, or I just like want to listen to y'all predict. Um, I do want to name that um, adult Spencer is really killing it because I, I just like think about how iconic baby Spencer was. I mean, like that kid, the, that's a really hard role to step into because that Spencer was such a mess and he was so beloved. Um, and so to have like a new actor step into that role and be able to like make us feel something is like really special. Um, what I would love to see happen is for Spencer to have to go work at Kelly's and live above Kelly's. Um, so he's working with Cam and also as penance for what he did to Ava have to like volunteer at her art gallery. And that way he has some time with, with Trina. That's a wish, I know it's probably not gonna happen but I would love it. Um, and then I need to know, like, I, I think when we before saw Ryan and Esme together um, and we thought it was Harmony, we thought that Ryan was scared of her. And I now think he was scared she was gonna give them up. And so um, I think that we're gonna see more of whatever is happening between Ryan and Esme, um, uh, like be, be, be out in the open for us to see. Uh, but I don't, but I now don't think that he is scared of her. Um, that feels different for me now. That's all I got extra. Sandra, I see your face. It, it just reminded me of a prediction I, I had while I was blow drying my hair, um, <laughs> which was um, about 
Esme, like we've been talking about her being connected to Victor and obviously to Ryan, we know that there's a connection there. But I was re-watching some of the stalker stuff before Spencer entered, like when they were actually receiving all the, the gifts. And it was coinciding with the Cyrus storyline and Nicholas. And there was a scene when they're all having dinner at Windermere because they're um, distract, they're providing a distraction for Carly. And what ends up um, pissing Laura off and kind of like blowing the night was that um, Cyrus like very subtly threatened Spencer and named that, she, that, you know, his reputation preceded him, that basically he's watching Spencer. And so it made me also think like, could Esme be connected to Cyrus in some way? Because also like Cyrus has like, you know, like Cyrus is obsessed with Laura. He would want, you know, he wants revenge against Nicholas. Um, you know, he wants any family connection whatsoever, whether it's good or bad with that family. And also Trina is his like nemesis, <laughs> which I love. And so I'm also planning this, this theory prediction because I want more Cyrus and Trina scenes because I thought they were so good. They were like my before Trina, uh, before Spencer came on the scene, it was like Cyrus was actually my favorite of Trina's. <laughs> <laughs> so I love this prediction because one, it, it actually solidifies her reason from being in the scene. Like we know that Esme was adopted, but we also know that she comes from money and Cyrus is wealthy. And I can also foresee like he kind of spirited his, his mom away and kept his mom a secret and separate from his you know, nefarious life. I can totally see him doing that for his daughter, if that was the case, or someone who he's really close with. And Cyrus, like you said, is an enemy of Trina. Cyrus is also an enemy of Sunny and Carly. So that would motivate Esme to, you know, pick fights with Sunny and Carly. Cyrus is also an enemy of, I was thinking of somebody else who she's targeting and I can't, it's not coming to me, but putting Esme on the scene, there's so much to dive into if she's related to Cyrus in some way, because she has that diabolicalness about her. Um, and we would want to learn more, like what made her into what she is now and being involved with Cyrus is huge story to explore so kudos on that prediction and i hope it comes true <laughs> get us in this writer's room y'all frank hit us up. Ryan's biological daughter cyrus's adopted daughter and then one of spencer's many cousins through adoption or marriage because god knows that kid is related to everyone on the scene but trina in some way mm -hmm. truth truth so I, we talked about this at the top and we didn't put this on like the docket, but do want to like just quickly touch on um, this thing um, with Nancy Lee Gron. I remember it was so funny when we first recorded, we were all talking about, we all like talked about her and the Viola Davis and we were like, Nancy, girl, I was so embarrassed. People know I know you. And so um for people who don't know, Ellen Pompeo, who is like Meredith Grey or Grey's Anatomy, um, she has a podcast now. So I think that she, and like she's writing a book and so just like anecdotes and stuff have been coming out. And so she let be known on a po her podcast that Denzel Washington like was the Denzel Washington, not like some Denzel you never heard of, the Denzel Washington, um, came in and directed an episode of Grey's and she was like trying to give direction to somebody and Denzel was like, hold up, I'm the director, you don't do that. And she responded like, hold up, motherfucker, it's my show. <laughs> um, and people were like, did you disrespect Denzel? And then like, like tell about it. Ellen went on to also say like, and then, you know, we're great now. I think he's, he's amazing. Um, she also said something about how um, she told his wife. So Paula, Denzel's wife came onto the set and she told uh, 
his wife that she had a problem with him. It was super, I don't, I don't know what Ellen was thinking. This is not the first time Ellen Pompeo has like said some wild shit. Um, and the connection to, uh, to GH is that Nancy Lee Gron tweeted in, re- in response, uh, so I'll read her tweets. Um, an actress isn't, a, isn't an employee or underling to a visiting guest director of a show that centered around her for 16 years, generating billions. GH films right next door to Grey's. I witnessed Ellen Pompeo be gracious, kind, fair, fierce, and take no sh- and a take no shit boss woman, my kind of gal. The takeaway is not a spat between a director and actor, which isn't uncommon. It's an emotional, unusual, unusual environment, not a bank. It's the vitriol directed at, the, at a powerful woman who's relating an experience on set that ended up fine because she dared to roar at a powerful man. Nancy. I, I'm going to be super controversial here and say white women stick up for white women. Um, not controversial. <laughs> okay, but I'm just like, she's totally ignoring the fact that Ellen talked crazy superiority shit to a black man who in actuality is more experienced and more well known than she will ever be and yet still you know had to work for years and years before he was recognized as the powerhouse that he is and so for her to come at him like that there there's definitely some racial dynamics that she and the funny thing is is that some white women who are married to black men feel that they can talk to black men any old kind of way and that is some fucked up shit (laughs) and i can't stand that and the fact that nancy legron will defend another white woman talking shit to a black man is not shocking to me the same way that she would go off on viola davis it's like, I can't. Like, liberal white women, y'all need to have several seats and stop it. Um, yeah, this is the first time hearing about Nancy's tweet. So I'm like, I'm reacting real time. To <laughs> so I'm, I'm not even thinking about the consequences of what I'm saying, but I don't care because it's like, really? Like, I can't believe, I can't. Sorry. Please not ever apologize. Okay, I'm not. I'm not sorry. <laughs> I, whew, I would say that being a person of color, a woman of color, and a Black woman who is part of a fandom is always, like, tough. Because, you know, like, I'm sure there are people who, like, listen to this who whose politics, like, you don't have to match my politics, right? Like, that's not, we can watch General Hospital and Kiki about General Hospital, and we do not have to have the same kind of politics, but you do, if you want to be inter, if you want to interact with me, have to like respect my humanity. And I think that sometimes when we're part of fandoms that ends up happening and being like a barrier. A lot of times I watch shows um, to like have an escape. Um, and when you have like these racial dynamics at play that you can't ignore, it's hard to have that escape. I used, to, I'm like, I, I'm part of Bachelor Nation. I watch all of it. Um, and I actually had a really hard time when we had a, the first Black Bachelorette because I felt so protective of her. You know, I watched The Bachelorette for mess. I watch it because I'm a Libra and I fall in love in two minutes. So I understand the concept of falling in love with somebody you just met. Um, I want to see crazy dates. I want to see just like all of it, the romance, the whirlwind. And then, but ABC does not have the range to deal with race. And so they were purposefully on Rachel's season we're putting together and putting like racist white men on her season to like create controversy and create conversation and not knowing how to handle the controversy that was in like the bachelorette house when like white men who have been shown to be racist after the fact were antagonizing black men in the house and so it was hard to like get swept up in the fantasy of it because i had to like watch this race shit happen and so the same thing i think happens within these fandoms um, and, and General Hospital, like, tried to do, I was, like, I was kind of quiet about it on the show, but, like, when they tried to, like, talk about race on the show, it's, like, 
in the same ways that I don't want anything that's really serious to be like a throwaway. Like Sonny's bipolar is not a throwaway. We talk about that because it's important because it's a part of the characterization, right? So why is it that this like one judge who was racist was kind of a throwaway for Sean to get out of jail, but we haven't continued to talk about the race, race issues in the criminal justice system, right? And like, if you're gonna do that, then like, let's go there and do it. But if not, let's just not, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's not touch on it if we're not gonna make it a part of the story. Um, and so that's just like how I was feeling. Uh, Nancy, I tweeted about it, girl, chill out. Like this was just like you said, Tanya, not understanding the race dynamics at play. Um, and Ellen Pompeo, she ain't even new to this. Ellen Pompeo has done a lot of mess before. I was on a town hall, and then I'll be quiet. I was I was watching a, a Say Our Name town hall, hall about uh, Breonna Taylor. Um, this was last year. Jesse Williams and the Advancement Project were doing it. And um, Ellen Pompeo was like invited. And so she was the only, I think she's the only white person. I think she might've been the only non-Black person on it. And so she specifically was like, they asked me to do this thing that I'm not doing. <laughs> and then like she took up all this space and started crying. And like you could see like the screenshot of all the people like on Zoom, like, girl, what are you doing? Like nobody asked you to do this. Like, so she is, she, because she is Ellen Pompeo, because she is Meredith Gray, she's allowed to take up the space. Um, because she like talks about her black husband and her black children, she's allowed to take up the space. Um, that is not like right. And I just even me as a black woman would never tell y'all if I ever disrespected Denzel Washington. I would never tell you. I wouldn't even tell y'all off camera. I'd take that to the grave. You could not ever convince me to tell my mama that I disrespected Denzel Washington. Period. And I bet I can guarantee just because of the character of Denzel that he didn't, you know, go off on her in the way that she deserved and that how he's quiet about it now, again, speaks to his character and it may, it, 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 but it's also like, yeah, he should be quiet about it and let her put her foot in her mouth and get roasted by the community. Like he doesn't have to do anything and he's above that and her. So yes, but she, uh, uh, and that's the thing, what you said about how it's problematic being a fan of, of someone as a person of color is true because I am a fan of her as an actress, as Meredith Grey. And, um, I, and I'm just like, ugh, I can't with you. And on the one hand, like we can't fault a, a, an actor for the character it's hard because I don't want to fault the character for the actor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's it's crazy. It's a crazy dynamic, but it's ugh. yeah. I feel that way about Alexis all the time. Like I I feel like I and, and about Nancy Lee Grand, where I'm just like you are probably like the closest of the people who like sp publicly speak on their politics to like where we might be. Um, people who are really vocal, especially when we have all these like you know, Ingo's running around, but um, yeah, it's really challenging because Nancy keeps running her mouth. And um, I think this girl boss shit, it's just like a, another example why this girl boss shit just doesn't work for anyone but white women because she's sitting here talking about what a boss Ellen Pompeo is, but when, when Viola Davis speaks up, that it's a problem. I'm still mad about it. I was just starting to get to a place where I was like, all right, Nancy, like I can, I can fuck with you a little bit. And now we're back here. And it's like, it, I think it's also a problem with like feminism on the show is that it's like the only feminism that's allowed on the show is white feminism. Like Molly being a boss and saving Sean with her investigation, even though she works at the DA's office. And I didn't even actually, I said, I think a couple episodes ago that I've watched every moment of GH for the last few years. That's not true. I didn't watch the suffragist episode. And I actually don't even know what happened in that episode, but I couldn't watch it, A, because I knew it was just gonna be a, like a lot of white feminism and B, I knew that they would actually continue to whitewash suffragists 
and also like a race that suffragists that white suffragists like Alice Paul were actually giant fucking racists and white supremacists so um white white women did not create feminism white women stole feminism from women of color um the end I don't have anything else (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can go, I can continue talking about this for like the fact that the fact that there was a whole episode dedicated to white suffragists and not about Black Lives Matter. They let you have a monologue about it. Oh, yeah. Thank you, GH writers, for giving Trina that monologue. I really appreciate it. Thank you for throwing us that bone. Anyway, I have some. <laughs> Tell us how you really Thank feel, Tanya. <laughs> um, well, the props for sitting, sitting Michaela did a great job with. What oh she yeah, did. amazing, amazing, amazing. amazing. And then like William Lipton, like lifting it up afterwards, which amazing. Um, you know, but Gen Z got this. They they know. Yeah. It's us. They're not. It's us. They're not the problem here. They're never the problem. They're never the problem. All right, well, that's our that's our show. Um, hope you still fuck with us after you write our politics. I remember <laughs> our first our first episode. We were like, well, we have these jobs, but like they probably won't show up. Here I am wearing a damn Shirley Shirley Chisholm shirt online. You're like you're like white women stole stole this from women of color. <laughs> like it's just you know it happens. Like the, our politics will always like our our existence is political, so our put our politics are always going to be. Uh, part of our analysis so hope you fuck with it if not you know see you on uh, hashtag gh and uh whatever (laughs) Um, (laughs) our mentions if not um it was so great to talk to y'all it's like therapy let us in this writer's room gh say bye (laughs) y'all bye